If you're just coming in, please have a seat. So I'm going to start out again today with a few simple logistics. Um, this is a reminder to register for the uh, poker tournament that we're having on Saturday starting at 8 p.m. If you go into Poker Stars, there are two tabs. There's one for your cash tables and one for your tournament tables. And go to the tournament tables and you should see uh, if you're in the club, which at this point I think just about everybody is in, uh, you'll see the tournament there and you should be able to click on it and register. Um, again, this is a completely optional practice one, but I want to kind of stress test the system and also before we actually play the satellite that's going to really count uh, to have everybody get an opportunity to have some experience playing. Also, we're going to be showing rounders at 7.30 in this room on Friday. Um, so that's tomorrow, tomorrow evening, those of you that are interested in seeing it. If you're not able to make that or prefer to uh, do it some other way, you can watch it on Netflix anytime if you have a Netflix account. Also last night we had a nice uh, group here watching All In the Poker Movie. Uh, we're going to show it again on Monday, uh, January 20th at 1.30. So that would be normally the class time, but that's a holiday so we don't have class and we're going to show that movie here. Uh, if you want to watch that on your own, that's available on Amazon Prime. So let me, uh, I did have a chance to play a little bit last night, and some of you know that because I played with you. And uh, once again, I have some feedback for you. Um, there was less open limping than there was when I played with you guys the day before, uh, but some of you were still doing it. Uh, so rather than just come in for 100 when the big blind is 100, I encourage you to try to come in for three times that. Uh, the raises, some of them, I thought the sizing was a little unusual. I was trying to figure out the logic behind it. Um, unless you have a specific reason for raising something other than three big blinds when you raise, uh, if you have another reason, then that's great. But if you don't have something that you could articulate and explain to someone, then just raise three times uh, the big blind. Also, I thought the opening ranges were a little wide. That means that you were starting with hands that weren't necessarily in the categories that I went over yesterday in class uh, that you should be opening with. Um, typically, you shouldn't play more than one or two hands in a round. And a round is when the button goes all the way around the table. So uh, if you have the button and the button gets back to you and you've played half of the hands, you're playing too loose. You're probably playing too many. Now, from time to time, uh, you know, the good hands will come and they'll come in bunches, but in general, I would say one or two times. And this could be fun when, you're, when you have play money in front of you and you're like, well, I don't want to sit out the whole time, I want to play, it's not real money. I even saw someone in the chat the other night say, oh, this isn't how I would have played it if it was real money. And that's defeating the purpose of what we're doing here. You're, you're supposed to be getting experience in how to play. Um, I also heard in the chat room yesterday uh, the word dominated used a lot in the banter. I thought that was kind of funny because <laughs> I taught you guys about uh, hand domination and uh, some of you uh, took heart to that. All right. So as you all know, if you read your email, we got a solution to the riddle uh, from Amber Hamlin who's going to come down in a minute and tell you the solution. Um, I have to say that at about 1.15 yesterday, I'm sorry, 1, 1.45, 15 minutes into class, I presented this riddle to the class. And the email that I got with the solution came at 2.30. So while Amber's super smart and did a great job solving this riddle, she wasn't paying attention in class yesterday. <laughs> um, and the lesson to me is to give riddles at the end of class in the future. And I'm wondering how many more of you were working on the riddle. Um, and like I said in the email, uh, Danny Blessing also came up to me at the end of class with the correct solution, but he is not eligible to get the automatic entry into my tournament because he's already got an entry as a course assistant. Um, so now uh, remember, I'm going to remind you what the riddle is, and then I've asked Amber, uh, and she's agreed to come up and tell you the solution that she came up with, which is the right answer. So looking back on the hand afterwards, and I'll preface this by saying that if those words were not in the riddle, the riddle wouldn't work, okay? So looking back on the hands afterwards is important. You had the absolute nuts on the flop. The absolute nuts means nobody could possibly have a better hand than you do. You had the absolute nuts on the turn. And on the river, you couldn't win or even chop. Before Amber comes down, I'll tell you that I did enjoy all of the guesses that you guys sent me, uh, including a detailed, an attachment with a detailed proof that this was impossible, which I really enjoyed. Um, <laughs> 
So it is possible. And now I'll ask Amber to come on down and tell you guys. And I'm going to be her scribe on the chalkboard. Um, hi. So I guess when I first started doing this, um, my first thought was that I like, first I tried random things and nothing was working. So then I was like, all right, there has to be like a methodical way to solve it. So I started by thinking like at the end for you to not win and not be able to chop, I realized that um, you'd have to like have a higher kicker. And so you would be, everyone else would be playing on the board. So I thought that probably meant that there would be quads. So then there'd be one card left. Um, and so then I was like, oh, and then for you to not have the higher kicker, you'd probably be dealing with low cards. So that led me to think that maybe there, you had pocket twos. And I tried everything with that. Nothing worked. So then I was like, OK, pocket threes. So um, that would be what you have in your hand. And now the trick to this whole thing is that you look back on it afterwards. So um, at first, you'd want to have trips. And so the flop would be a two, two, and a three. Um, and now here, the trick is like, you could think, oh, someone could have pocket twos, and then they'd have quad twos already. But we know that the turn and the river are both going to be twos. Um, so that means that that's why, looking back, you would know that they wouldn't have it, which would only be done like in hindsight. But so then um, for the turn, then another tricky part was the full house. Someone could possibly, like, if they did have a higher pocket pair, they would they wouldn't have a full, higher full house just because it's based on the three cards instead of the two cards. So that one's for that. So that was it. And then um, at the end, everyone else has quad twos, but um, all the twos are accounted for, and there's only one three left in the deck. And so that means only one person could have that three, and they'd have to have another card that's higher than a three. So that's why you could, couldn't possibly win. Excellent. On the river, your hand is quad deuces with a three. You're basically playing the board. And then why does someone have to have a better hand? And this is what Amber said. There's only one three left in the deck. And so the worst possible hand that's out there is three, four. But that beats you because it's quad deuces with a four. And a lot of people actually emailed me uh, that you have twos, the same idea, but with twos. And the reason that doesn't work is because on the turn, you end up with three deuces up here instead of three threes. And so if anyone has a higher pair than that, then um, they've got you beat and you don't have the nuts. So that was a fun riddle. You can take that to your, to your poker friends in the future. So let me talk about how to describe a hand, OK? I'm turning all of you guys into poker players. And you're going to have poker friends. That's what poker players have. And you're going to go to your poker friends and you're going to say, you're not going to believe this hand that I had last night. And you want to describe the hand to them. And there are correct ways to describe a hand and there are incorrect ways. And how somebody describes a hand is a pretty good indication of how much they understand about poker. So the things that you want to include when you're describing a hand, the most important thing is what were the stack sizes. If you start telling somebody, about your hand and you don't say whether you were deep stacked or shallow stacked, the rest of your play doesn't make any sense. Because so much of your decision about which cards to play on the pre-flop, on the flop, and even later in the hand depend on what the stack sizes are. Did you have implied odds? You know, Remember that high cards go down in value the deeper the stack is. So if you don't tell someone how deep the stack was and you just tell them that you had pocket kings, they don't know whether pocket kings is a strong hand or not. Same thing for suited connectors that go up in value as the stock size goes up. Next, you want to tell them about your table image. You say, well, everybody thought that I was really tight because I hadn't played a hand in a while. Or I had gotten five really good hands in a row. I raised every time. Everybody folded. They thought I was a maniac. I was going to use that to my advantage. You have to, as part of describing your hand, talk about what your image is. And then talk about how you've been playing recently. Have you been aggressive? Have you been passive? Are there players at the table that know you and know that normally you're very um, you know, timid at the table, but today you're being very aggressive or something like that? Um, you want to tell people when you're describing your hand what your position was. I was under the gun. I was on the button. I was in the cutoff. The cutoff is one before the button. I was the big blind. That's part of your description. Of course, don't forget to tell them what your hand was. 
you know, I had ace queen suited, I had pocket fives, whatever. And then you want to describe your thought process when you're describing the hand. And the last thing is, what was the action? Okay, my opponent raised, uh, the next guy re-raised, I four bet. Okay, so what was the action? So let me give you an example of how not to do it. Um, this is how some people who really aren't that familiar with poker will describe a hand, and you'll hear this all the time. I had a pair of aces. I bet big and got one caller. Flop came low cards. I check raised him and he called. Turn was another blank and I bet out. He shoved all in and I called. I can't believe he hit a set and I lost my whole stack. Okay, this almost didn't mention anything of all the most important things. Um, so now, um, I've been teaching a long time and one of the mantras of teaching is you don't just read your slides uh, if they're long and wordy, but I'm gonna do that anyway just for fun on this one. <laughs> I started the hand with a hundred big blinds and looked down at pocket aces on the button. Most of the table had me covered, but the donkey in seat three had only 60 big blinds, and he had been very active lately and he was steaming because of a few recent bad beats. He did not like folding, so I was going to try to isolate him. The under the gun player, who hasn't been very active, raises to three big blinds and the donkey calls. It got to me and I decided to try to isolate the donkey rather than go multi-way to the flop, so I three bet to nine big blinds. The under the gun folded as I expected and the donkey calls. I hadn't been raising much, so I was worried that I would give away the strength of my hand. That said, the donkey wasn't much of a thinker and I doubt he was paying attention to how often I was raising. He probably had a hand like he was, and he was going with it. The flop came with three low cards, rainbow, which I was happy to see, but then the donkey came out firing a pot-sized bet. Considering the way he had been playing, I decided that he often has nothing there or some low pair that I'm beating and I can't fold. No point in raising as he'll just fold out any hands that I'm beating. However, if he's bluffing and I call, he might continue bluffing on later streets and I have position. So I just call. The turn card looks like a blank and he shoves all in. At this point I have to call as I was hoping to induce a bluff and I can't fold when he does. Furthermore, since he only started with 60 bigs, it's not that big a bet, so I call. The river is a two and he shows seven deuce for two pair and cracks my aces. Um, that's okay, I want this guy at my table anytime. So if you look at the various elements of the thought process that's described here, you're talking about your table image, you're talking about what this guy might or might not be thinking. Um, when you say you call, the reason you say you call is, well, I don't think he's gonna call a bet of mine unless I'm ahead of him and I wanna induce a bluff. So you're kind of going through a lot of the thought process that you're supposed to have when you describe a hand. And so when you describe a hand, I want it to look more like this than like the first one and we're gonna give you that opportunity. So, you're gonna play a lot of hands in this course online. Some of you may be playing with your friends, live games as well. And over time, you're gonna learn a lot about reading opponents' ranges and how to reason about a hand. So what I'd like to ask is if you have an interesting hand, you email the description to me and to the two course assistants. All the emails are here. Uh, I'm gonna post these slides after class and you can get that. Um, and I may follow up with questions and discuss it over email. So I'm not going to just take your email and tell you you're coming up in front of the class. I'm going to want to probe a little bit and see how well you understand the hand and what your thought process was. In fact, if it's super interesting, I may invite you to my office and we'll continue to discuss it. This is what I do for fun. Um, I may invite the best ones to be pre presented to the class by you and then uh, encourage discussion. I want you to be sure to include all of the important details like the stack sizes, the position, your perception of your opponents, your table image, etc. So this might make it more fun for you now when you go out and you play. If you have like a hand that really, um, so I can tell you that sometimes when I play, I get home and there's that one hand that's nagging me like really, really badly. Like, did I misplay that? Did I misplay the turn? Did I, should I even have been in there pre-flop? You know, I wouldn't have lost my whole stack if I hadn't have played the hand. So those are the hands, the ones that you're questioning yourself. Uh, did I have the pot odds to call? Did I have implied odds that you should maybe consider for sending? Okay, so getting back to the continuation of the lecture from yesterday. Uh, just to review, we talked about hand selection criteria, which is when do you, what are the criteria you use to decide if you're going to go into the, to the hand or not. And remember, you shouldn't really be playing on the average more than one or two hands every orbit. And I know that that's hard, um, but you have to ask yourself which you enjoy more, playing or winning, right? If you're there and you're like, well, it's no fun to sit out, so I just want to play, 
then fine, you can play all this garbage hands. But if you want to actually win and you want to learn poker properly, you have to sit out a lot. But you shouldn't be on your phone or on your laptop or, or doing something else. The point when you're sitting out is to observe the other players so that when you get into a big decision against another player, you've watched them play a bunch of hands and you see if they're aggressive. Um, watch those showdowns at the end. And I know Poker Stars is very quick to hide those hands, but you can go into the chat and scroll up and see what the hands were that won. Uh, so, and then, by the way, when we play the tournament on Saturday, in tournaments, as soon as uh, uh, all the players are all in, the cards will turn over. And that's a really good chance, if you're not in the hand, for you to get information. Work the hand backwards. You see what they showed, and go now say, okay, what did they do pre-flop? What did they do on the flop? And, and now you know what their cards were, and so you can sort of replicate their thought process. Okay, so yesterday we looked at the big pairs. We looked at medium pairs, small pairs, ace-king and ace-queen. And for each of them, I gave you a strategy of how to play them, whether you're going to always raise with them, or raise 20% of the time, or call, or fold. So now we're going to continue with the remaining hands that are worth considering. And these are ace-deuce through ace-jack. I've written a little graphic to give you my opinion about these hands. Um, one thing to remember, do you remember Annie Duke spoke to you yesterday and she said that whether you're suited or not improves your odds of winning by 2.5%? That's a little misleading. It is true mathematically that if I take ace-10, say, and I take ace-10 suited and I run it out against random hands with random boards, that you'll only win 2.5 more times with the suited hand than you will with the non-suited hand. But the thing about a suited ace is that it gives you a lot of ways to what's called semi-bluff, which is you have a lot of outs, right? You're not going to make a flush more than like 2% of the time, but you're gonna make a flush draw quite more often. And a flush draw gives you opportunities to bet because when you have a lot of outs, it's not a bad time to get money into the pot. I think that ace-deuce through ace-jack are the most overrated hands. Um, the reason is that bad players love aces, okay? I have an ace, I'm excited, right? But remember that any ace other than ace-king can be dominated by ace-king. And when you're gonna lose the most money in poker is when your hand is dominated. It's the one time that you have a very low chance of winning the hand. Now, the other thing about a weak ace and even ace-jack is considered a weak ace, is let's say somebody in early position raises, and you call them. Let's say you have ace-seven. What flop are you hoping for, right? Do you want to see an ace? This guy that raised in early position, ace-king and ace-queen are a very large part of their range there, right? So very often you're going to be dominated and have a very small chance of winning the hand. And then if you're not hoping for an ace, are you hoping for a seven? Because if a seven comes, you're probably going to get a couple of cards up there bigger than a seven as well. So let's say it's come seven, jack, queen, and you have a seven. How excited are you now when the somebody raised? Because queens and jacks are in their range, and now you don't know if you're good. And so what happens is, if you have these a seven, these middling aces hands, on the flop, you're very often not going to know where you stand. You're not going to know if you have the best hand or the worst hand, and you're not going to know if you're dominated. And so the easiest thing to do, which I do 95% of the time with a6, a7, is just fold. Fold it pre-flop. It's a really, really, the negative implied odds, which we talked about yesterday, are very high, which means if you hit your hand, you may lose a whole lot of money because you could be dominated. Now, the other thing is there's a slight exception for when you're suited. If you have a suited ace, that's a lot more valuable. And also, ace-5 is a lot more valuable than ace-6, ace-7, ace-8. Because you're not playing it for the 5 value, you're not playing for your 5 kicker, you're not playing to hit a 5, but ace-5 can make a straight, and ace-6 cannot make a straight. So if you're lucky enough to get 2, 3, 4 on the board at some point, then you're going to have a pretty strong hand. So these hands, they play better in position, and in particular because if you're out of position and you have a hand that might be dominated, you could actually be in a lot of trouble. If you're in an unopened pot near the button, so say the hijack or the button, you can play these aces just like you would normally play ace-king. And the reason is if you're only up against two or three random hands, 
the probability that someone has an ace goes way down. If you're at a nine-handed table, uh, there's a pretty good chance that another player has a better ace than you do. But if you're on the button and all you have to worry about are the blinds, then I would say that you should raise with these aces because you're probably ahead of the other two hands. Um, if you're playing at a weak, low stakes table, uh, you can play these weak aces more often because the weaker aces will be in those games. I can tell you that I play in a, a regular home game at a friend's house, and there's about 30 people there most of the time, and you can tell who the stronger and the weaker players are with one metric. Watch how many times they show down a weak ace. If you see them playing a6, a7, I can tell you they're not in the elite group of players at that, at that game. In early position, you might play ace-jack suited, but throw all the other ones away. The problem is, if you're under the gun or under the gun plus one, too often you're going to be playing against uh, a whole bunch of unknown hands, and one of them might have a bigger ace, and you're guaranteed to be out of position unless you end up against one of the blinds. In middle position, I would say ace-jack and ace-ten and suited aces at passive tables, but at an active table with a lot of raising, don't even play those hands. Uh, when I first started playing poker and studying poker, and I read this in a poker book, Dan Harrington says, in middle position, you could pretty much throw away ace-jack. I said, well, ace-jack is a top 10% hand. What am I playing? And the answer is, wait till you're in late position, okay? You have a, every one of the sets of hands I've gone through, uh, I've said many, many more hands you can play in late position. In early position, middle position, there's almost no hands. If I'm under the gun and I'm raising at a nine-handed table, I have ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack suited, pairs down to sevens, and you know, I'm probably not playing too many other hands under the gun. If I'm on the button, I'm very happy with four-six suited. Okay, because I'm on the button, I'm going to act last. If I hit some big hand, that'll be great. And as I move away from the button towards the under the gun, kind of the range, if you imagine this bag full of hands, the bag kind of shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. Whoops. In late position, um, you can play suited aces and ace 10, but don't play aces like l weak aces if the pot's already opened. That's only if you're the opener. And it's pretty rare in most poker tables to be you know, on the button and everyone just folds to you. If that happens, then, then go ahead and play. But if somebody raises, just throw away those aces. Now, Doyle Brunson gives a category of hands called trouble hands. How many people have already watched the All In Poker movie, either on your own or in here yesterday? OK. So you guys have seen who Doyle Brunson is. The rest of you will see. He is perhaps, you know, he's the granddaddy of poker. He's a two-time uh, World Series of Poker main event champion. Interesting fact that both times he won it with the same hand, uh, and the hand was one of the garbage hands, 10 deuce. And so 10 deuce is referred to as the Doyle Brunson. Uh, he's been playing poker, you know, for 60 years or so at the elite level, and he's kind of one of the old school guys. But he wrote a book called Super System and Super System 2. And those, for many players, are the Bible of poker. Those are the books that people grew up um, learning on. And I really enjoy his books. Um, so he coined the term trouble hands in his book. And these are hands that you feel very good about when you get dealt them. They're nice looking. They've got two Broadway cards. Broadway is 10 through ace. Um, and most players, if you've been sitting there all day folding jack deuce, queen three, all these nothing hands, and all of a sudden you're dealt king queen suited, you got to play it, right? It's, it's a fun, nice looking hand. Um, and you feel good if you make a pair with it, because it's usually going to be top pair with a decent kicker. But if you're dominated, you're in trouble. And every one of these hands is dominated by ace king down to ace ten. Okay, that means that you share a card, but they have a bigger kicker. And that's trouble because these are exactly the hands that most people don't fold. So if you have king-queen and you're at a table, I don't recommend folding king-queen pre-flop in late position. But keep in mind that if somebody bets, let's say that somebody in early position raises, and you know they're a good player, so you know that they're, often they have a pretty good hand if they're under the gun and they're raising, and you have king-queen on the button, I don't recommend folding. I think you should call. You got position, you have a pretty good hand. But if you hit either of your cards on the flop and the player 
gets very aggressive with you, at some point in that hand, you, you should consider folding, especially before the really big money goes in, because you could be dominated. And so if that's said, and if good players know that you do that, you take it to the next level, right? If a good player knows that you're a good player, and they know that you are calling with king-queen very often, and they have absolutely nothing, and that king or that queen hits, they might bet big to represent that hand that dominates you. Which is why it's questionable whether you want to even get involved in a hand at a really tough table when you have king-queen. And there's a danger here that you're going to take all this logic and say, well, I can't play anything, right? But the thing is that they don't know what your hand is just like you don't know what their hand is. So they can represent ace-king, but so can you. They may not have it. And that's why you need to observe the table. If this is a person that nine times out of ten, they try to represent the strongest possible hand, which they could only have one times out of ten, only once out of ten can you have a top 10% hand, right? That's just simple math. You're not going to have a top 10% hand 40% of the time. You're going to have it 10% of the time. So if somebody's raising like they have a top 10% hand 40% of the time, you know that at least three quarters of the time they're full of it, right? And so you want to re-raise them. Some of these hands even dominate the others, which is why you should consider king-queen to be a lot stronger than queen-10, uh, significantly stronger. So the weaker the trouble hand, the worse the trouble hand is. And you shouldn't call big raises with these hands too often, especially not the lower end of the dominated hands. So this, what is the strategy then for these trouble hands? In early position, okay, you can play king-queen suited. It's such a beautiful hand, uh, it's hard to get rid of it. But don't play any of the other trouble hands if you're early. That's like the first two seats, under the gun and under the gun plus one. In middle position, if the pot is unopened, you can come in with king, queen, king, jack, and queen, jack. Now when I say come in, do I mean limp? Never, right? Three big blinds. If you're opening up, I want you guys to drop, so the first day I played with you guys, or not the first day, but two days ago, almost every hand was like limp, 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 limp. Yesterday, maybe two-thirds of you guys weren't limping, and one-third were limping. So I'm going to get on there tonight, and I'm going to jump from table to table. I'll try to play like 20 minutes with one group and 20 minutes with another. And I'm, I'm going to come at you in the chat if I see anybody open limping. Okay? Don't do it. I'm okay with you doing it if you have aces, but only if there's someone like Danny at your table who's going to always raise you. Okay. In late position, you can play these, but be careful on the flop, even if you hit. And take your opponent's tendencies into account. If you're up against passive players and you hit, then that's good, but be careful against really active ones. If you ever get three bet with the trouble hands, just fold them. Okay, so we only have two more categories of hands to look at, and then we're going to do something else that I think will be fun and interesting. Um, these are suited connectors. Suited connectors are hands that are consecutive, like your two cards are 9-10 of clubs, uh, queen jack of spades, like the ones in the pictures here. Note that um, hands like ace-king and 2-3 are less valuable as suited connectors than hands like 9-10. What's the reason for that? Let's see a hand. Yes. Right, so 2-3 and ace-king are limited in their straight potential because you can't go up with the ace-king, which means that for the 9-10, there's a lot more possible straights than there are when you're on one of the ends. Now, Annie Duke hates suited connectors. I don't know that that came through in the video I showed you, but I've read, uh, she has a book out, and she makes all these arguments why these things are no good. On the other hand, Dale, Dan Harrington and Doyle Brunson love them. I think that Annie hates them because she's primarily giving advice about tournaments, whereas Dan Harrington and Doyle Brunson are talking more about cash games. So in tournaments, once you get past the early stages of a tournament, you should kind of forget about your suited connectors. Um, you can treat them as the cards that they are in terms of their rank. So if you have 9-10, you have a 9 and a 10, but you don't have the flush draws or the straight draws. And why is that? And I've already explained this, so I want to see if you guys, if it's sunk in. Let's see a hand if somebody has an idea why late stages, mid stages of a tournament, the, the pseudo connectors go way down in value. Yes? Because relative to the big blind, you have smaller stacks. Exactly. 
So you have a smaller stack, which means your implied odds, the number of big blinds you can win, goes down because you just don't have that many big blinds. And that means because flushes are so hard to hit and straights are so hard to hit, in a cash game, you're willing to lose a lot of small pots trying to hit that straight or that flush because when you hit it, you can win so much that you'll win back everything that you lost and then some. In the late stages of a tournament, you just can't. And so when I see somebody with 15 big blinds in a tournament shove all in with eight, nine of hearts, you know that that person didn't study the math and they don't know it, that, that that's a bad move, right? In a late stage of a tournament, if you have ace-jack, you're excited to push all your chips in because you're playing a non-implied odds hand. You're playing for the value of your actual cards when you're really short stacked. Okay, so um, these play well as disguised hands. So um, when you do hit your hand, it will often not be apparent, especially with straights, to people that you hit them. In early position, I mostly fold these. Um, Dan Harrington says to raise occasionally around 20% of the time, but that's not for the same reason as we've been talking about now. That's for deception. You cannot play what we call ABC poker. So I can teach you the ABC rules of poker, and then 15 to 20% of the time, you should not play ABC poker. So what happens um, if you have a suited connector that's low cards, and everybody knows that you're a pretty straightforward, strong player, and so you're almost always raising under the gun with aces, kings, queens, and ace, king. And now you raise under the gun, and you have 9-10 suited. And the flop comes with a flush draw and a straight draw for you and an ace. So now your opponent is pretty sure that you hit that ace. And they're going to play you that way. And maybe your opponent hit two pair, and your straight comes in on the turn. And these are not hypotheticals. These things happen all the time. Your straight comes in on the turn, your opponent knows you have ace-king, there's an ace on the board, they've got two pair, they're going to push you really hard. And you fooled them, you hit your straight, and you're going to win a lot of chips. And that only happens when you occasionally mix in hands that don't fit within the normal rules of how you play. And that's why he says 20% of the time. It's easy to get carried away, though, and say, well, deception is fun, and I really enjoy when people don't know what I have. But if you go much more than 20%, now you're making a mistake you're putting in money with a bad hand in the wrong position, and that's not good to do. In middle position, you can raise more often, like 50% of the time, only in, again, deep stack cash games. And it also depends on how active you've been lately. So if I've been catching a lot of cards, and I've been very active lately, and I get suited connectors in middle position, I'll fold them more often than if I've been playing very, very tight, and I haven't gotten into a lot of pots, and then I get suited connectors. Now there's going to be more belief that I actually have something, so I have a little more deception in that middle position. In late position, you almost always raise. And the reason for that is you want to play in late position as often as you can. And again, this is an unopened pot. Um, if there's been one, one bet in front of you and you're in late position with a suited connector and a deep stack, I would also call. But if the person that's in the blinds is a very, very, very aggressive person that's been raising 50% of the pots, and you will find people like that, then I'm more inclined to just throw it away. OK. The other thing about suited connectors, and we haven't talked much about multi-way. We've talked a lot about heads up, is that if there are a lot of players in the hand, then you want to play suited connectors more often. And the reason is that you have higher implied odds with more people in the hand. It's more likely somebody will hit something, and if you hit your straight or your flush, you're more likely to get paid if you're up against four players than against one. Now, the thing to remember about suited connectors is you really are playing them for straight and flush value. So very often, you're going to hit one of your cards, and you're not going to get a straight or flush. Much more often, you're going to actually, say you're playing 9, 10 of spades, you'll hit a 9 or a 10 on the flop more often than a flush draw or a straight draw. And then you're going to have kicker problems, right? Because you have suited connectors, so your other card is also not very high, unless you have ace-king as your suited connector. But I'm talking about the ones more in the middle, which are the ones where you're getting the straight value more often than on the edges. And so you need to be careful when you have a weak kicker. So in large multi-way pots, suited connectors are great. You have better implied odds because straights are, can be hidden monsters. Like I said in the beginning of the class, most of the five-card boards that can come by the river have possible straights on them. 
If there's no possible flush and no pair on the board, we know there's no full houses and no flushes, then the next best hand is going to be a straight, but nobody is going to be so worried about a straight that they're going to fold two pair because it's just like most boards have a straight and you're just not going to worry about that that often. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of other playable hands and then we're going to talk about all the other hands. So in late position, everything, basically everything that I've talked about so far, those should be 90 to 95% of what you play. You really shouldn't play anything else. Um, but you can play um, occasionally in middle or late position or if you want to add to your deception. Unsuited connectors like 9-10 off. S suited and unsuited one gapper. A one gapper is like 7-9 instead of connected 8-9 or 8-10. You have to be in good position and you want to be in a tight table where there's a lot of folding and little three betting. And the reason is that if you play these hands and there's a lot of three betting, you're just going to be throwing away chips because you better not call a three bet when you're playing with one of these hands. But you want every flop to contain a threat to your opponents. If, they, if, if it doesn't, then, then you're not playing correctly. If you, if you only have ace-king or ace-queen when the flop comes 10-8-7, you're going to be really easy to beat. But if one time you get to that flop of 10-8-7, and a lot of money goes in and you end up showing the table 6-9, first of all, they're going to be really angry. They're going to be like, you're such a donkey, you play 6-9, I, I love having you at my table, and stuff like that. The thing is that you're going to get a little more respect the next time. And when they try to put you on a range of hands and they try to figure out, you know, what do you have, and they remember that that last time you raised with 6-9, then they're going to be like, well, gosh, I don't really know what this person has. And so there's a big advantage to doing it, but don't get carried away with it. Now, all the remaining hands, every single possible other two-card Texas Hold'em hand, don't play them. Don't ever play Jack-3, 8-deuce, King-4. Now, I know there's one person sitting in this room right now, and you know who you are, that beat, I had pocket aces yesterday and I flopped an ace. Who, who, who was this person? You don't have to stand up. <laughs> and, and the person hit either 2-4 or 3-5, I don't remember, they hit a straight and took 10,000 chips from me. Because I, I flopped a set of, of aces. And this was one of those garbage hands, and, and that's okay, because I, I hadn't given you this lecture yet. But now, <laughs> um, now you should know, don't play these hands. And I asked you this earlier, like, if you just enjoy playing, you know, there's blackjack, there's slot machines, there's craps, you can play all day long. But if you enjoy winning, then you have to play proper poker. In deep stack cash games, winning the blinds is not a thing, right? You don't want to take a hand like queen six in late position and put in a big raise and everybody folds and you're like, yeah, I won the big and the small blind. <laughs> big deal, right? But what happens if the big blind re-raises you? You're folding queen six, I hope, right? And so these hands, they're just too many good hands that you're going to get over time. There's no point in playing these. You're going to only play like two hands per orbit and you might decide after this lecture today that poker's boring and that's fine. But remember, during the other eight to nine hands, you should be observing the table and you should be trying to get a read on all of your oppo opponents. And the good hands will come. There's a very famous saying in poker, there's no shame in folding. You usually hear that from the big blind in a tournament when the small blind is trying to decide what to do. Okay, so that's the end of the starting hand strategy. And the strategy that I gave you would be called a tag, tight aggressive, okay? Not all players are tight aggressive. I am tight aggressive. I recommend that you play tight aggressive, but a lot of players are lags, loose aggressive, and the really good lags win the most money. The problem is that the really bad lags think they're the really good lags, and they're not. So a lag will play more hands, and they're going to have more disguised hands. You might, you might have a guy in your game that you're like, how does he always get so lucky, right? How does this player always do it? I mean, he only had jack three and he hit, you know, two pair. And no one else ever does that. And the reason is no one else ever plays jack three. And they may win the one huge pot that keeps them coming back to poker, but they're not playing very well, unless they're a very good lag. 
Um, the, the lag has to bully, by definition, right? Because the lag is going to hit the board less often than the tag, right? The tag is going to be playing good cards, and if he doesn't hit the hand, he's going to fold at some point early in the hand. The lag is playing bad cards. If he hits the board, it's going to usually be the bottom part of the board, and he's often going to be behind. So the way a good lag makes his money is by bluffing, is by being a bully, is by trying to get other people to fold. And some people can be good at that. Um, if you're playing tag, odds are you're not going to be, that other players will not be playing as tight as you. And that will make you easier to read because they know that you're tight and aggressive, which is why you have to throw in some of that deception. Now, David Skolansky is one of the um, kind of founders of the theory of poker. His book was in the first uh, day I showed you guys the books I used, The Theory of Poker. Uh, it's a fantastic book, but it reads like a math theory book. So unless you're a mathematician or computer scientist who likes that kind of thing, you might not enjoy it. I personally love his books. And he came up with Skolansky's rule. And Skolansky's rule is super applicable, and you don't need to understand any of the theory behind it to apply it, which is simply that you need a better hand to call a raise than the original raiser needed to make the raise. And why is that? Well, think about this. Think about the strategy that I gave you guys in terms of what you can raise with and what you can call with. There were a lot more hands if you're in an unopened pot. Say that you're in middle position with an unopened pot. Most of the hands that I described as being playable, I recommended that you come in for a raise. But a lot of those same hands, I recommended that you fold if somebody's already raised when it gets to you. And so if you're sitting at the table, let's say you're on the button, and you're trying to assign ranges to all the other players in the hand, and the first guy under the gun raises, and the guy three to his left calls the raise, and you're on the button and you want to figure out what do these guys have, you should put the guy in early position on a wider range of hands than the guy that called. And that can be really useful, especially when we look at some of the moves that you can make at the poker table later on. Okay, so this is what I just said. Now, the deeper the stacks, the less important the gap concept is. And the reason is that you're playing for implied odds. And so the caller's range is going to be wider. You're more likely to call with pseudoconnexors if you have a deep stack. And so you can't start ruling out those hands the deeper that the stacks are. So let's do some exercises. I'm going to make this a little interactive, so be ready to, to try to help answer these. Say that you're at this table, and the first thing you should do when I put a table up is let's look at the stack sizes. That's the most important thing. And then the second most important thing is let's look at your position. So notice that you're in late position. You're one behind the button in the hijack. And your stack is $200, which is 100 big blinds. So we're playing deep stack cash. Blinds are one, two. That doesn't matter. We're talking about how many big blinds. And we see that most of the players have pretty decent stack sizes, except for player D, who has a very short stack. And you have pocket threes. And you've also observed that player D, the one with the short stack, is tight. So before I even start, what's the first mistake that player D has already made? Just hands so I can, yes. Short, short stack. Like you're playing cash game, you're allowed to always add to your stack. So if he lost a big hand and he has 40, he should, he should have 100 at least or 200. He should buy in for the table max. He always should, I think. So. A, B, and C all fold. Remember the A acts after the big blind, so he folds, B folds, C folds. Player D raises to $8, and the question is, should you call or fold or raise? And this ties into the strategy. Remember we talked about small pairs. You do have position. So let's see a show of hand. Who, who's the callers? Couple of callers. Who are the raisers? few raisers. Who's folding? Most of you are folding. Okay, the key thing in this hand is the opponent only has $32 behind. Once he bets $8, he's got $32. Your odds against hitting a set are 7.5 to 1. Remember we talked about odds against? And the reason is there are only two cards that can give you the set. On most flops, you're not going to be able to call, right? Because almost every flop you're going to see is going to have a card above a 3. And this guy is going to bet out at you. 
and so you should fold. So I'm with the folders here. Now here's a question. Let's say that I said D was tight in this example. Let's change that. Let's say he's a lag, super lag, okay? So he's playing a wide array of hands, and I'm gonna ask you again, uh, call, raise, or fold. So who's calling? Okay, who's raising? Who's folding? It's about even, I think. Well, I don't have it on my slide. I would still fold, okay? Because the thing is that, at best, he's got two cards over your threes, which are putting him about 50-50 against you. But there are a lot of pairs, fours through aces, that he could have and play this way too. And even though there's a lot of junk, even his junk is, is often beating you. Like, like if he's playing queen, queen five, which he should never be playing, but he's a super lag, he's still 50-50 against you. And if he has a pair, he's not going anywhere. So um, the problem is if you have a small pair and you're up against a short stack, you don't want to get involved. That's the lesson. So let's look at a different type of hand. You have four six of hearts. And now let's look at the table and we're gonna look at stack sizes, position, um, and we're gonna also look at player tendencies, which I've identified a few. Okay, and by the way, uh, these hands that I'm showing you are out of uh, Harrington's book. So we see that the stacks are very, very large. We have over 200 big blinds, $1,300. Uh, uh, we have 1,100, sorry, almost, almost 200 big blinds. The player B has big, player A is short, and then there's a bunch of medium and another big at F. Okay, so we've got, a, we got the lay of the land. We're playing deep stack poker, right? We're playing at least 100 big blinds here, pretty much. Um, we have a tight player in front of us, and then behind us, there are a bunch of aggressive players, and we're out of position. So the first question is, we're a third to act. Are we excited with suited, connect, suited one gapper, four six, out of position? We're not excited. No, we shouldn't be. So player A folds, and player B, who's the tight player, raises to 20. So that's just a little more than three big blinds. And should you fold, call, or raise? Or we'll just, we all know this one, right? Considerations are that the, deeps, the stacks are deep, and the stack being deep calls for calling, but you're in early position and you have aggressive players behind you. You know that with four six of hearts, if you call and someone behind you raises, you're gonna have to fold. And you have three aggressive players behind you. Furthermore, you're gonna be out of position, so this one is like a no-brainer. You're just gonna fold it. Now let's look at a couple of brainers. Um, so now let's, let's examine this table. So we're in the small blind, and we got pocket nines. So we finally have like a, a pretty decent hand. Um, the stacks are pretty big. We have over 100 big blinds, so do most of the players. And then I've noticed that I've picked up a tendency on player F. And this is part of the observing the table and watching what people are doing. I've noticed that player F likes to raise unopened pots. That's a very specific tendency, but that's one you should look for. Because if you see that every time everybody folds to a person, they're raising, you still aren't getting top 10% hands more than 10% of the time. That's just a mantra, right? And so if they, every time it's unopened, it gets to them, you have to figure that they're doing it with a very wide range. It's much wider than the range of hands that I recommended that you play in all those positions. And also, he's in late position. So players A through E fold, and player F, who likes to raise unopened pots, raised to 40, and before I go on, he raises to 40, what's the range that we're gonna put that player on of hands, wide or narrow? He's in late position, he's deep stacked, and we already see that he likes to r r open when it's unopened to him, and we've already gotten like five folds, right? I'm gonna say that that player, there's very few cards he doesn't hold there, okay? He's, he's coming in, pretty wide. And then the button folds, and now it comes to me. And so the question is, am I going to fold, call, or raise? So how many people are folding? Good. No, you not fold here. Um, how many people are calling? And how many people are raising? Okay, we got it about half, 
between calling and raising. And this is where I'm going to teach you something that is going to apply very, very often and is very fundamental. So here are your considerations. What is F's range here? We said it's the world, right? How will my nines play post-flop? Always ask yourself, when you're in a difficult decision, you're sitting in the small blinds with pocket nines, a really loose player raised. I would call that a difficult decision. What's going to happen if I call? How are my nines going to play post-flop? Well, what's the flop going to be? I wish I knew. I don't know. But I can tell you it's probably going to have a card above a nine in it, right? Very few flops don't. If this guy were super, super, super tight, and he raised, and I called, and three low cards came, I could be really nervous. They could have a jacks. They could have a better hand than me. But against this player, I'm going to the bank if three low cards come. I am not putting him on a big pair, because he could have so many different hands here. Okay? And then they ask yourself, will I have position after the flop? And the answer is no. So if the answer to not having position out after and the fact that your um, nines are not going to play well after the flop, do those factors lean towards a call or a raise? Call, raise. I say raise, and I say raise big. And the reason is, this guy is a clown, right? He probably doesn't have anything here. I'm probably going to take his 40 bucks right now. But, and I want to put him to the test, and I also want him to know not to mess around with me, right? So I'm going to raise big, and the real reason is I'm kind of afraid of the flop, and if I don't like the flop, then, then I'm going to have to act first, and now what do I do? So the question is, if the flop comes king 10 3, and I'm out of position, do I bet? Do I check? Neither of those is a good option. Raise big, define the hand. Now you know if he calls you, maybe he really does have something. If he's, if he's betting 40 and then he's calling 240, then I'm going to say, okay, okay, let's change that range. I'm going to say he has a pretty good range and play it from there. So you raise to 240 and everybody folds. So yay, you took down $40. All right, let's look at an even harder one. You've got pocket tens and let's look at the table. We're playing big stakes here, 5-10. So that means the big blind is $10. And you have $1,800, so you've got a lot of big blinds. Uh, most of the table has a lot of big blinds here. So uh, particular, particularly player G has a lot of chips, and he's a lag. Um, and then player B is a tag. And both of those are going to be important. So I want to make sure I emphasize to you that if you don't have labels for your opponents, if you're playing for a while and you can't say tag, lag, you're at a huge disadvantage. Because a lot of your reasoning is going to be based on what label you've assigned to your opponent. And you can adjust your label. You can say, that guy's a tag. And then all of a sudden, he shows down a hand where he raised an early position with 7-10. And you're like, well, maybe not such a tag after all. Or maybe he's a really good player and he's got a little deception in him. OK, so A folds. Oh, and your position. Your position is you're in middle position. You're two behind uh, the button. That's often called the uh, cutoff. OK, so C and D fold. B, I'm sorry, let's start over. A folds, and B raises to 30. Is that a standard raise? Yeah. Is he in early position? Yes. Is he a tag? Yeah. So is our, the range that we gave the guy in the last hand, who was raising in lay position, and he always liked to raise on open pots, is so different from we're giving a guy who's in second position and we know he's a tag. So now we're like, okay, this guy probably has a pretty good hand, right? And then C and D fold, and now it comes to me. And this is a very different situation from the last hand, and the question is, do I fold, call, or raise? So how many people would fold? Okay, how many people would call? And how many people would raise? OK, well, let's look at our considerations. You don't have a strong enough hand to raise. And you're going to be in position after this, right? So at least against that tag. And your hand is really too strong to fold. It's the fifth best hand that you can start with. It's, it's a pretty good hand. And so I say that you call. Now, by the way, I want to give a little caveat that when I teach computer science and I tell someone, this is x and x is y, I can usually back it up. I can prove it. 
Everything I'm telling you in this part of teaching you poker is just my opinion. And you could find 10 other players that would play this differently. The only thing is that I can only teach you my opinion and Dan Harrington's opinion. So I took this hand from him and he's a world champion winner. So it, it does have a little more weight than just my opinion. But you should remember that nothing is gospel with respect to how you play a hand. There are certain things that are clearly mistakes, but other things are just tendencies or strategy. All right, so you call the $30 and player F folds. But player G raises to $100. Okay, now we have a lot more information, right? Picture yourself with actual money. Somebody gives you $1,800 and they say, you get to keep this at the end of the day, but you have to play poker with it. And so you're in there and you're in this hand. And this is a lot of money for you. And the tag bet 30 and you called 30. And now G, who has seen, now let's assume that everybody's a decent player here for a minute. He has seen a tight player, he can assign the same range to the tag that you can, right? So he's seen a tag, a good tag, put in a raise, and remember the Skolansky's rule, and, and, and that you have to have a better hand to call, better range to call than to raise. He's seen you call, so you know the first guy has a pretty good hand, you possibly have an even better hand, but not like a super great hand, or you would have raised, and he still raises to 100. So what is our range for G? Narrow, and yet he's a lag, so not as narrow. So there's, there, there's several factors leaning towards narrow range, and there's one factor leaning towards maybe not such a narrow range. So the blinds fold, A folds, and then the B calls the other 70. So the pot is now 245, and it costs you $70 to call. Okay, now we've stepped in it, right? So we have, let's go through the action. We had a raise to 30 by a tag. We called. Now we get raised to 100, and the tag calls the 100. That guy has a good hand, but we know he doesn't have aces or kings, right? So what we try to do is we look at their range, but we also try to rule out hands. There's just no way that he would just call there with aces or kings, right? He would raise again, because up against two players, you usually want to be up against one. And he also, we've indicated strength, and so if he has aces, he's hoping we have queens and that, that we're going to get it all in. So. Um, Anyway, it's our decision, now what do we do? Well, I won't tell you yet, but we have to consider the fact of what our pot odds are. So I haven't brought that up much today, but when, anytime you have a difficult decision, the first thing you ask yourself are, what are my pot odds? And your pot odds are 3.5 to one. Okay, that's good, it's not great, but it's good. But what do I need to do to win this hand? I need to hit a 10, right? I'm pretty much not going to win this hand at this point unless I hit a 10. These guys have something better than my 10s, I can tell already. And what are the odds of hitting a 10? Well, it's pretty small. I'm going to flop it. The odds against flopping is like over 7 to 1, 7.5 to 1. So I don't have the pot odds to call. But what are my imply odds? That's where you look at the stack sizes. And what I'm walking you through now is exactly the reasoning that I think an experienced poker player would, would go through. What are the pot odds? Okay, what are the odds against hitting? Pretty high, but what are my implied odds? And if you think about it, considering that you're putting your opponents on hands like jacks, queens, ace king, all these kind of hands, um, you're, and, and actually the lag could have aces because he raised the only time it was to him. So you're, you're thinking that your implied odds are pretty high because if you hit your 10, you might get a lot of bets out of these people. Okay, so, call, call. Not strong enough to, to raise, implied odds are good enough to call. It's not that your hand is strong enough to call, it's not, but your implied odds are high enough to call. Okay, so, I already said all of that. So now, you call, whoops, I'm a little lost in my slides, okay. You call the $70, and the, the, the pot is now $315. So we've built ourselves a pot, and at this point, every decision is going to be expensive, right? The big money's going to go in, and that money that our uncle gave us, $1,800, we're starting to feel like it's slipping away. Player B checks, and now the question is, what do we do? And the two options are check or bet, right? Check. Bet? Okay. 
Well, let's look at our considerations. You were really in playing for the implied odds to hit your set, and you didn't hit your set. At this point, one of your opponents or both of them could have you beat. We don't think that player B has aces, but we think player G could. But we don't feel very good about our hand. Even though the three cards are below ours, we have to be super worried about those bigger pairs. And the other thing is now there's real money at play, right? We're on the flop, there's a big pot, and one or two more bets and we're going to be all in. And so because of that, I would check. So you check, and now player G, who has seen two players check, bets $400. And there's only 315 in the pot. And player B folds, and now it's up to you. And so the thing is, on the one hand, you could say, well, player G is a lag and a bully and a jerk, right? So we really don't like that guy, and he's trying to steal this pot. And why would he bet more than the pot instead of half? Didn't Professor Rubin say you should bet half the pot all the time? And now he's betting more than the pot. And the question is, what do you do? And you found yourself in a tough situation. And what you need to do is go back to your reasoning for calling in the first place. Your reason for calling in the first place is that your implied odds were high. If you win a huge pot, if you hit a huge hand, you're going to win a huge pot. You don't want to get into a huge pot with a small hand. And at this point, tens is a small hand. So you fold. If you call, there's going to be $1,115 in the pot, and you're going to have $1,300 left. And then if he's better than you, he's going to bet again and put you all in, and you're going to have to call. So even though it looks like you're, he's betting 400, he's really betting the rest of your stack. And unless you're willing to put in your entire stack with a pair of tens, you should fold. This is the reason why this hand is a good example of why cash games are harder than tournaments. And why cash games are deep stacked, you make implied odds decisions that you never even come across in tournaments. Because in a tournament, when you're playing 30 big blinds, with those tens, you would have either shoved them all in or folded them, but you're never going to call. Okay? In the situation that we had in this hand, when you get re-raised with those tens, when that G puts in that money, you have two options with 30 big blinds, shove or fold. And they're both decent options. In a cash game, you can call. Okay, so let it go. So now I thought, I've kind of worked your brain a little bit, and it's time to see something fun. What's really fun about this clip, this is a few minute clip of a hand, so I've picked out for the course like a bunch of hands that have lessons in them or that are really fun. This one is really fun, and the funniest thing about it, in my opinion, is the commentators, who are just like beyond ridiculous. So listen to what the commentators are saying closely. Okay. <laughs> So we saw how one person played pocket queens. Now let's figure out how we're going to play them. Um, need to kind of settle down after that one. I feel like that was pretty wild. OK, I'll tell you what. Um, at the end of this hand, I've got another one for you. Um, not quite as dramatic. So your hand is pocket queens, and you are under the gun. So we've got, let's, before we decide what we're going to do, we're going to do our usual survey of the table. So the blinds are 510. This is a pretty decent stakes cash game. And we have 2800. We are the chip leader at the table, which doesn't matter in a cash game because of effective stacks being what we're playing for. And we see that everybody has pretty much 1,000 or over. One has 900. So again, we're playing deep stacked. And remember what I told you, the deeper the stacks, the less in love I am with the big pairs. But this isn't like super duper deep. This is a really good situation and a really good hand. So the question is, do you fold, call, or raise? And since I know everyone in this room knows the answer, you're going to raise to 30. But that's not what you do. You call 10. So in this example, I'm going to show you the consequences of misplaying a hand. And um, in this case, you were supposed to raise to 30, but you raised to 10. Player B folds, and player C and D call. And players E and F fold, and G calls. Notice that G is aggressive. And the big blind checks, and so we, the small blind also calls. And do you see what you did? You now have six players going to the flop, and they could have all kinds of crazy hands. Try to put an aggressive player in the small blind or G on a range. You can't. They, they could have anything here. And as each person calls, the next person has better pot odds to call. 
And so what you end up with is an avalanche effect. If you have a limper, then people tend to limp and limp, 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 limp. Let's say I'm on the button with three seven of hearts. That was in the category of garbage, don't ever play it. But if five people limp in front of me, I'm calling, right? Because of the times that I'm going to hit two pair or two threes on the flop or something like that. So queens, you want to be heads up. And so now we're in a pretty bad situation. So we have a, a pot of 60 because six people put $10 in. And the flop comes 854, right? And the question is, like, are we happy? Well, we're not too sad. I mean, it could have been worse. We didn't see an ace or a king. So the small blind and the big blind both check, and now it's my turn. And the question is, what do I do? How many people think you check? How many people think you bet? And how much would you bet? Half the pot? OK. Um, so not a bad flop. You avoided the ace or the king. The only hands that beat you right now are sets, two pair, like 8-5 or 5-4. And those are unlikely to be out there because one of those cards is already on the board. But they're very possible. And the person could even have 6-7 out there. Because you know why? You didn't raise preflop. If you raise preflop, you're not going to worry about the 6-7. You're not going to worry about two pair. And you're really only losing to the sets. OK. So with five opponents, one of them probably hits something. Right? There's pretty much no chance that one of them doesn't have an 8, a 5, or a 4, like some kind of pair. And you can't let it check around. You have to bet this for value because right now you probably have the best hand, but you may not forever. And if you let five players see a turn, then probably you're going to be beat. Unfortunately, you screwed up again, and you just check. So small blind and the big blind check, you check, C and D check. And then player G, who's aggressive, bets 45. And the question is, what are you going to do? Well, the small blind folds, the big blind calls 45. And now there's 145 in the pot, and it's 45 to you, and what do you do? And now you're like squirming a little, because there's money in the pot. You probably have the best hand, but you're not sure about it. You have no idea where you stand. And here are your considerations. You're probably the best, right? Most likely, you have the best hand. Next question, always a natural question. What are your pot odds? Well, they're 4.2 to 1. And there are a ton of turn cards you don't want to see. Anytime there are turn cards you don't want to see, you want to bet because you want to get people out before you see that turn card. You don't want to see cards that will make it likely for someone to have two pair. You don't want to see straight cards like a 6 or a 7. I would put in a raise here to $200. We've had a $45 bet, another $45 bet. Go ahead and, and take this pot away. You've got the best hand. Bet 200. Unfortunately, you just call. And now C and D fold, and the pot is 195, and there are three of you. The turn is the six of hearts, one of the worst possible cards you could have seen. The big blind checks, and what do you do? Do you bet? Well, let's consider it. Anyone who has a seven has already got a straight. There are many more two-pair combinations now, 6-8, six, 6-5, six, 6-4. Six, and you no longer can say that you probably have the best hand. So don't put any more in the pot. And now, let me also make how many most important concepts have I given you? This is the most important concept. It's likely that if you bet, worse hands are going to fold. right? Anyone that's got a worse hand than your queens is going to probably fold it. So much money's gone in. There's been bets. There was a big raise. There were calls. Oh, no, we didn't raise. But there's been a bunch of bets. So are you getting any value when a worse hand folds? No. A worse hand than yours folds, but you were beating them anyway. Are you going to get a better hand uh, to, f I'm sorry, if, if a better hand is going to call you, that's not good either, right? So if you bet and a better hand calls you, that's no good, or if they raise you. So there's really no point in betting. You don't have a story of like why you bet, and so you should check. And you, you finally get it right. You check, and G checks. That's interesting. So everybody's checked. So maybe no one's in love with this board. The river is the two of diamonds. That really shouldn't change anything, unless someone had a pair of twos or something like that. And now the big blind bets 100. And you groan, right? And the question is, what are you going to do now? And a lot of people will call here. A lot of, a lot of people are playing poker will call here. But you want to start asking yourself, uh, to reason about what your opponent has. 
So consideration is he only bet half the pot. And so remember that when we learn pot odds, we say you don't only think about your pot odds, you think about the pot odds you're giving your opponent. And your opponent just gave you three to one pot odds. What does that tell you? It means he wants you to call. Remember the last example, there was like 350 in the pot and your opponent bet 400, right? Here, there's 195 in the pot, he bet 100. Probably expects you to call that. And so your queens are no good anymore and you should fold, and you do. So here are the lessons. Passive play early on gets you in trouble. You didn't raise preflop and you let in all kinds of hands. So somebody could easily have a three, a seven, both of those were straights. Six, eight suited, that's two pair. And you didn't raise on the flop when you probably had the best hand. That was another mistake. You made a good fold on the river, but that's a pretty bad result for queens. And by the way, you're not certain that you made a good fold on the river. You think that you did. So the moral of this story is to play more aggressively pre-flop and on the flop when you have a strong hand and don't limp. So let's round up starting hands. This is the end of starting hands in this class. And the question is, should you ever fold king's preflop? I asked you that question before, and I said no, you shouldn't, but we're going to see a video in a minute um, about that question. The odds that you're up against aces are pretty small, but there is one situation where you can safely fold kings, and that's a bubble situation. A bubble is a special point in a tournament right before the money. So let's say that 100 people enter a tournament, and the tournament pays 10%. That means 10 people are going to cash, right? If you come in 11th place, you've just played for five hours and you get zero. And if you come in 10th place, you're gonna get hundreds of dollars, okay? That's called the bubble. So bubble situation is 11 players are now playing poker. And let's say that there's somebody who's the chip leader. He's got the most chips at the table. And you're second in chips. Right? So you have the second most chips. And three of the 11 players have like one or two big blinds. They're about to go out and you'll be in the money. Okay, this is called a mega bubble situation, right? And what happens if you pick up kings and you raise? And now the guy who's the chip leader, who's been super active and bullying everyone, goes all in. And it folds to you. So now your reasoning should be as follows. If I just go take a lunch break <laughs> and I don't play, these three guys are super short stacks. In 10 minutes, they're going to be gone, and I'll be in the money. And even coming in 10th place is hundreds of dollars, and coming in 8th place is a lot more. Number two, I'm second in chips right now. And I'm going to do really well. I may come in the top three in this tournament. In fact, I took Avi Rubin's class, and I'm better than everyone here. And I have a lot of confidence in my abilities to outplay these guys. So do I want to risk my entire tournament life with these kings? The flip side is, this guy is, he knows that it's a bubble. And he knows that I should fold here if I want to play the bubble. And so he's raising all the time with garbage. And my kings are probably an 80% favorite here. And if I call, I'm going to double up and I'll be the chip leader. And then I'll be in a position to win the tournament. So your reasoning should be, how much more money does first place get than 10th place? Because if first place, as an extreme example, let's say first place in this tournament is $10 million, okay? And let's say that 10th place is $300 up to second place, which is $1,000. Okay, it's a no-brainer to call there, right? You have an 80% chance, most likely, that your kings are good and that you're going to win, and then you're going to be the person who's the favorite for that $10 million. On the other hand, if the structure is that the top 10 players make almost about the same, you know, it's $5 more for each one and they're each getting $1,000, it's a trivial fold. You're like, okay, if I just fold, I'm going to get in the money and all the money's pretty much the same. And so what you have to do in real life is look at the differences in the payout structure and make your decisions about what to do with your kings. This is the only situation that I can think of where you should fold kings preflop. But here's another one. Okay, that's, that's what you call a really, really good read, and that's super impressive. Um, if you're playing in the World Series of Poker for $10 million, and you are sure that your opponent has aces, I guess you can fold kings. I would have been knocked out there. Unless, you know, actually, 20% of the time, the kings will win. 
you know, you might flop quads or something like that. We've seen it happen. Um, so let me, let me talk about bet types. We've got about 10 more minutes. Um, and I'm going to walk through some of the different types of bets that you can make. The value bet is probably the most common. You think you have the best hand. And usually, as I've said to death, you want to bet about half of the pot. And a value bet is designed to get money in the pot when you have the best hand to make a worse hand call. I put that in bold because the themes are going to be when you have a good hand and you're betting for value, you want to get a worse hand to call. Why does that matter? Because you're actually going to size your bet perhaps differently. You have to think about what is my opponent's range and then what part of that range would call what size bet. So if you're going to deviate, remember I said you can deviate from the half pot bet if you have a reason. One reason might be I think my opponent's super weak and he's only going to call me if I bet a fifth of the pot. You think your opponent only will call if you give him tremendous pot odds, then just bet a little bit. If you think that your opponent is strong but not as strong as you are, you can overbet the pot and they're still going to call you. So the point is, if you're value betting, you absolutely think you have the best hand. You want to deny proper odds to draw, so you never bet less than a third of the pot. Remember, a third of the pot is the break-even point for most draws. And you also can value bet to take control of a hand, because you want to have the betting lead. Then there's a bluff. A bluff is the opposite of a value bet. You think you do not have the best hand, and if you're putting money in, the only reason is to make a better hand fold. And once again, you want to size your bet, keeping in mind that your opponent has a better hand. So think of the range of hands your opponent has. Think about your opponent's tendencies and how they play. And think about a bet amount that will make them fold. And it doesn't always mean that they're super strong. You could have 3-7 on a jack-jack ace board and bluff at it. In fact, you better bluff at it if you want to try to win it, right? But your opponent could have 10-8. And 10-8 is, is a very weak hand, but it's better than yours. And it won't take much of a bet to get someone to fold in that spot. So sometimes a bluff is big, and sometimes a bluff is small. The definition of a bluff, though, is that you think that you have a worse hand, and you want them to fold. Another reason why you might bluff is to set up future bu bluffs on later streets, and also to get some credibility. If you are known for never bluffing, then when you actually have a hand and you make a value bet, everyone will fold. They know it's a value bet. And so sometimes you need to bluff just to mix up your play. And the smallest bet that will do the job, why should you risk more money than you need to on a bluff? Now here's a warning, especially for beginners. Don't overdo it. You are putting money in the pot when you're behind. And I know there's a temptation when you see a lot of money in the pot and you know that you're beat to say, well, I'm going to steal that. And you see that a lot in poker. People are just fighting for those pots. But it's a bad habit to throw money into the pot when you're behind. And so be sure, or be fairly sure, that it's going to work. Then there's a semi-bluff. A semi-bluff is a bluff where you've got a lot of outs. So you have a drawing hand. Let's say you have ace, ten of clubs, and the flop comes king, seven, deuce. And you bet, and your opponent will call you. And now you think he's probably got a pair either in his hand, or he's got a king or a seven. And you have an overcard to the board and the nut flush draw. So we can say, let's call that 12 outs, right? Your three aces and your nine clubs. But you feel like you're behind. OK, what I've just described is like an everyday situation. How many times do you have like a big draw, you make a bet, your opponent calls, and you're like, well, there's no way their hand isn't better than mine right now. And let's say the turn comes with a blank, like you know, three of spades, OK? Doesn't change anything. You know that you don't have the best hand, but you're still going to bet. And maybe if your opponent bets, you'll raise them. And the reason is that you have a lot of outs. A semi-bluff is a safe bluff compared to just an all-out bluff. Because there's no better feeling in the world when you semi-bluff, and you get called, and then you hit your draw. right? Because now you've gotten a bunch of money in. Your opponent calls. You know they've got a good enough hand. And now you have the best hand. And so you're probably going to get paid a lot. Let's look at it a little more analytically. So with 12 outs, you have a 44% chance of winning the hand, right? And the, the, the way we know that is, remember, there's uh, 46 cards in the deck that we haven't seen. So there's 36 bad cards and 12 good cards. And we can calculate the odds against, which will come up to 56%. I'm not going to go through all that now. But you see two cards to turn in the river. 
And 30% of the time, the opponent will fold to a turn bet. Okay? So this is based on your, your hand wavy kind of feel for the table. That if you bet, they're going to fold 30% of the time. So let's look at your chance of winning. If your opponent folds, which is 30% of the time, you win the hand. So you're going to win the hand 30% of the time. But let's say that he calls and, and it gets down to the river. Of the other 70% that he doesn't fold, 44% of the time, you're going to hit your miracle card, or not even a miracle, you'll hit your ace or your club, and you'll win the hand. So 44% of 70 is 30.8%. So when he folds, you win 30% of the time, and when he calls, you still win 30% of the time. If you didn't bluff, then 30% of the time you're going to win. That's not so great. But if you semi-bluff, you make yourself a favorite in the hand because you have what's called fold equity. Because 30% of the time he folds, you win, and 30% of the time when he calls, you win. And all of a sudden, your semi-bluff made you a favorite in the hand. And in a cash game, if you're a 60% favorite, you have an edge, and so that's good. And so that's the power of semi-bluffing. Now, I should say, tread carefully, Maybe he won't fold 30% of the time, okay? Or maybe he has a monster, right? Maybe he's a player who never folds. You should, in your regular game when you play with your friends that you play with regularly and you get to know them, you should try to figure out how often people fold when you bet. And you want to do semi-bluffs against the players who know how to fold and not against the guys that never fold. And if you get raised when you semi-bluff, you're done. And that's a risk because you had this great draw, right? And if you check or if you just call and you don't semi-bluff, you have a chance to see if you hit your draw. Whereas if you bet and you get raised, then you have to throw it away and you just wasted a big draw. The other thing is you might hit your hand. Let's say in that example you hit your ace and he had two pair or a set. Uh, in that case, you're going to lose. So uh, semi-bluffs are very powerful, but you don't want to overdo them. Don't semi-bluff every big draw. And I can name, I could rattle off names right now of people I play with who semi-bluff every big draw. They just always do it. That's not a good idea. Okay, so I am out of time. I have several other bets to go through, but I'll pick them up tomorrow. And please register for the tournament, and I'll see you at 1.30 tomorrow. <laughs>